Here's another choice. You can either have $4,000 with probability 0.8. Of course, you know, the implied thing here is that then you get zero with probability 0.2, in case that wasn't clear. Or you can have $3,000 for sure. Okay, let's take a poll. Who wants the first one? So how many want 3,000 for sure? In this case, the $3,000 with probability 1, people seem to prefer by a fairly wide margin. Okay. Now... As per our earlier discussion, I wish I had, you know, like the men in black thing. It's like, oh, you, you know, you hit the button and people forget what just happens. So let's, let's try to do that as much as possible, right? Because ideally that's what you would do in an experimental sense. So, you know, flash your memory. Now here's a second question. Would you rather have, this is obviously a worse set of options. You know, you like the first one better, you don't like this one as much. $4,000, probability 0.2, zero with probability 0.8, obviously. That's how probabilities work. Or, you can have $3,000 with probability 0.25, and zero dollars with probability 0.75. Raise your hand if you want the first one. Raise your hand if you want the $3,000 with probability 0.25. So we have a clear win. <laughs> and it's the other one. So I got you to I got your behavior to change pretty significantly, right? Okay. I want you to consider these side by side for a second. Um isn't the second set of options, just the first set of options with the probabilities divided by four. Right. So think about this. I'm going to do again the, the expected utility calculations. So I'm going to make no assumptions about what your utility looks like at all. I'm going to say here the expected utility from the first one is just 0.8 times the utility you get from 4,000 plus whatever your wealth level is, plus 0.2 times the utility of your wealth level. Right. The expected utility of the second one is just the utility you get from 3,000 plus your level of wealth. Right. Either one of these choices can be rational. I don't know. I don't know your life. Whatever, you know, some people might like one thing, some people might like another. But based on which one you chose, the traditional model of expected utility means that I can imply that whichever one you chose gave you a bigger expected utility number. Okay? Mm -hmm. Can't you say, like, for example, for the second one, you were taking on 5% more risk? but you're gaining 33% more return. So wouldn't it be better to go with the 4,000 if you think about it like that? It's just 5% more risk, but you're getting 33% more return. You could say that. I would say five percentage points more risk to be super right. precise, right? You could say that, however, even that calculation is not consistent with the expected utility model. Right. right. So you could so think about this in a number of ways. It's kind of like the Sharpe ratio in finance. So like, couldn't you think about this, the first one also like that instead of the expected utility? Yeah, I mean, you could think about this however you want. I guess that's kind of the point, that the traditional economic model, you, you know, we take this, you know, in basically all of your other economics classes, we're taking this expected utility model for granted as the way people think about risky choice and you just provided another alternative, you're like, well, wait, if people are thinking in this way, yeah, that's something you could do. There are a lot of things you could do. That's another thing that's not necessarily consistent with the expected utility framework, right? See, if you had divided like 4,000 and 3,000 by four, then maybe like, you know, you're gonna get stuck with it. But then, you know, because it's like a guarantee to retain the first one, obviously people are gonna go for that. But because you didn't scale the numbers, then like, I don't think it all kind of evens out like he was saying. Well, 
goes, I, I purposely here, and the, the authors of the paper purposely only met, messed with the probabilities because technically speaking, I want to make as few assumptions as possible regarding what your utility function looks like. And if I started scaling the numbers within the utility function, in order to do any sort of comparison, I would have to make assumptions about what your utility function looks like, right? If I'm only messing with the probabilities and thinking about the expected utility model, this is going to be valid. This is going, you know, this conclusion that we're drawing has to hold regardless of what your utility function looks like, because I haven't made any assumptions in that way. That what we're seeing here is that people seem drawn to certain outcomes. It's like there seems to be some bonus, you know, some psychological bonus attached to things that are for sure. Because, you know, think about the expected utility calculations here. You know, simplify this. Let's say, you know, just make this super easy. And just say, you know, assume, you know, W is zero. So, you know, the utility of W is also zero, right? But that makes it super clear how these should compare to one another, right? So if you assume this, you're like, oh, well, if W is zero, this becomes zero, this becomes zero, and this becomes zero, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can see very, very clearly that the second one, the expected utilities, are exactly equal to the first ones divided by four. Mm -hmm. Just based on how math works, if the one on the left was bigger, in the first case, the one on the left would also have to be bigger in the second case, and vice versa, right? So it's just another, you know, I, I'm not necessarily trying to for sure describe. I'm describing how the traditional expected utility model is not consistent with individual choice, and actually in the way that you mentioned. You're like, well, wait, people seem to be putting a special weight on certainty on a probability of one, that's again something that the, you know, the basic model that we've been taking for granted, that we've been using to reach a lot of conclusions, can't account for, right? That just like we saw with the first exercise, this expected utility model can't explain why someone would switch from one to the other when the problem was changed by scaling the probabilities and taking away that certain option. You guys are pretty, pretty normal. You're probably even more extreme than the experimental subjects in this case. Because you can see here, in the first case, 80% of respondents wanted the thing with certainty, which is consistent with what you're saying, that they're getting some additional warm fuzzies from not having to think about risk. But when we scaled it, this is the option that corresponds it to the certain outcome in the first choice, and rather than 80% of people picking it, only 35% of people picked it. So they're basically a slightly less extreme version, but they are basically doing what you guys did here. And we call this, not surprisingly, because of you know what you said, that what seems to be happening is that people behave differently when there's an option with the probability of one. And that when there's a gain for sure, People are somehow seeing that as like extra good, maybe. What does that imply people would do if you had an option where there was a certain loss? If people are irrationally drawn to the for sure gains and people are biased towards the certain option when we're talking about gains, what do you think would happen when people were presented with an option, one of the choices had a short loss. If people are putting extra good feelings on a short gain, they're putting extra bad feelings on a short loss. Obviously, that's the way that that should work. So we would expect, if we were to have an option with a certain loss, that people would be biased away from it in a similar way that they're biased towards the certain gain. 